I want to welcome everyone to today's Teaching Tuesdays, Best Practices for Designing High-Quality Courses, the Blackboard Exemplary Course Program. I am Dan Cabrera, the Multimedia Coordinator for the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at Northern Illinois University. And today's agenda, we'll talk about the need to address quality standards for online courses. Why does it matter? How do your online courses rank? We'll do a little bit of comparison of rubrics. I, I know that there are quite a few uh, rubrics from different organizations, and I, and I don't want to say that there's a rubric war, uh, because a lot of, uh, of the rubrics contain elements uh, common to each one, um, and so it's not really one versus the other, uh, but I will make a comparison between at least two of the rubrics. I will be focusing on the Blackboard Exemplary Course Program. That's what the focus of today's workshop is on, and we'll be spending time going through the various aspects of, of the rubric. Now, I have to warn you that the rubric is, it's got quite a number of items in it, uh, the exemplary course program rubric. We really don't have time to go through all of them, and I will repeat this a couple more times. It would take about four hours to adequately go through each one, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about how the rubric is used and, and what the purpose is and how it's used, and then go over some of the primary or the big categories uh, that are so important for online teaching, and then uh, go through some examples of these, what we call standards, and, and then give you some examples of how those standards might actually look. And then lastly, uh, any questions you might have, uh, I'm not going to ask you to hold them uh, until the end, because sometimes there's a certain urgency to ask a question that needs to, for, cl for better clarification. So if you do feel that there's a need for that, there is a little uh, icon on the bottom, right below the slide, it looks like a little uh, stick figure or a little man or woman uh, with her arm raised. You want to do that? Okay, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I appreciate the demonstration. Bobette, okay, thank you so much. So you guys are all familiar with wanting to ask a question. If you do have a question, then uh, just uh, you can either uh, use the microphone icon, which is also in that same line of icons, uh, or if you don't have a, uh, an, uh, a microphone, you can always just type in in the chat area, and I'm happy to respond to that. I'm going to turn off my um, my webcam. Okay, let's see. Going to advance here. All right, so I'm going to ask the question: uh, Are your online courses exemplary, or do you feel they're exemplary? And by exemplary, I mean are they effective? Are they engaging? Uh, do the students uh, feel comfortable? Do the students feel uh, part of a community? Okay, so now the exemplary course program, which is what we'll be talking about today, with its peer and expert review process, really can help provide valuable insights into your course. Okay. So let's, let's do a, a quick comparison between two different, um, I guess, organizations, rubrics that they use, Quality Matters, and I'm quite familiar with Quality Matters. I, I received uh, uh, multiple uh, training sessions with Quality Matters. I've also conducted a, uh, a peer review of a faculty member on campus here, so I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it. And if we look at the, uh, the way it, it's broken out, there are eight categories. When you can see, I can, I'm not going to go through all of it. It's just course overview and uh, int uh, introduction, learning objectives. Uh, let's see, course activities and learn interactions, uh, accessibility and usability. So of the eight broad categories within each uh, broken up are, are, are called specific standards, specific review standards. There are 43 uh, specific review standards. And the methodology, uh, the focus for quality matters really is on st standardization and on consistency so that this is uh, a product or a, a course that meets a certain level of, of acceptability. Uh, these, these standards are in fact adopted for online teaching here at NIU and also by instructional designers who are part of uh, the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and so they, they develop those things. It's quite rigorous and in fact to conduct an official uh, quality matters review uh, is a little time consuming. Uh, it, there is a cost the university has to pay um, and um, uh, there was very little room, there was very little wiggle room. It has to be very strictly adhered to. 
On the other hand, the, Black, uh, the Blackboard, gosh, I keep saying that Blackberry, Blackboard Exemplary Course Program Rubric has four categories, so it's reduced that, that uh, total number of categories. But it, within those four categories, it has 53 indicators or 53 standards that fit in there. Um, we'll, we'll go through the, the various ones, the course design, interaction, and collaboration, assessment, um, and learner support. What I would say about the uh, Blackboard Exemplary Course Program rubric is that for faculty who, who are utilizing it to improve their own courses, I would say that it's more aspirational um, and that uh, students or faculty have opportunities to be more creative um, and um, if, if in fact a uh, faculty member wants to help have some assistance in utilizing it, they can always contact uh, either me or one of my colleagues at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning to discuss how they might uh, run their own self-assessment for the course. Let's just give you some examples. This is somebody else's uh, slide. This is not my slide, like I said, I want to acknowledge it, but I, 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 I uh, saw this in the on, uh, Online Learning Consortium Accelerate conference a few weeks ago. It was an excellent presentation, and I'm sorry I, I can't uh, give the, the correct citation for this, but I just wanted to show you here how there's a lot of similarities in, in the different rubrics. This is the, o, uh, the, OC, uh, the OSCQR rubric versus Quality Matters, and you can see that there's some consistency overview, course overview and information. There's something very similar in Quality Matters. But then we go to Course Technology and Tools, and you, and you find that it actually ends up right here in Course Technology, uh, design and layout, it's actually, there's no real uh, similarity here. There's content and activity. So you can see that there, there is an attempt to, to have, to share some very important characteristics. So the, um, the exemplary course program actually began in 2000. So it's 20 years old. But with the goal of identifying and disseminating best practices for designing high quality courses. So people were thinking about this a long, long time ago. Now the core of the program is the exemplary course rubric, which really defines key characteristics or elements of high quality courses within the framework of course design, interaction and collaboration, assessment, and learner support. So the, the, uh, the rubric really is meant as a guide for faculty and instructors to improve their own online courses. Uh, and that's, that's the primary element of this, of the, of this uh, uh, Blackboard exemplary uh, program. Now, there is also a, uh, as a part of this, the exemplary course program cohort. It's a four week webinar series. And, and really what's done in the series is to, is to discuss key characteristics of the high quality courses within the framework of the course design, interaction, collaboration, assessments, and learner support. And people who are participants, they review the, uh, the rubric and what this can look like uh, in courses that are either in original course view or the ultra course view. And the goal is really to, after four weeks of, of the training, is to walk away feeling confident in your ability to assess your own course. Um, actually, I haven't participated in the, the uh, cohort, but I have viewed the um, recordings uh, of it for, and, and there is one week, uh, or I should say one webinar session for each one of these uh, broad categories. Uh, they spent about an hour talking about that. So we'd have to have, we'd have to spend four hours talking about all the stuff that they do. The purpose for today's is to make you aware of what this rubric is, what its capabilities are, uh, what it, it, uh, its uh, assets are, and, and to point you in, in that direction. But I'll also say that I'm gonna share the rubric with you. Unlike Quality Matters, which is very proprietary, uh, the Blackboard Exemplary uh, Course Rubric is Creative Commons license. And so you can use it uh, in any way you feel uh, appropriate. Now, in addition to this, there is a opportunity to um, submit your course for review uh, by Blackboard uh, exemplary, exemplary uh, staff and volunteers, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But the, uh, along with the rubric in the webinar series to help you learn more about uh, exemplary principles, Blackboard really celebrates the winners who develop and assign, or I should say design these exemplary courses. So these educators and instructional designers are really improving the quality of online uh, instruction at their institutions for their students. 
and the exemplary course award really highlights their effort. And so you submit that, it's reviewed, and if it meets a certain standard, you are uh, uh, awarded this, uh, and that's somewhat prestigious, uh, recognition of your accomplishment, and that your course actually is worthy of, uh, of a high quality recognition. Now the exemplary course uh, program recognizes instructors and course designers whose courses demonstrate best practices in, in, the, in the same four areas I've mentioned before, which is course design, interaction and collaboration, assessment, and learner support. So for those who want to share their creativity and artistry and originality, the focus on submitting courses is to get feedback from others. So you submit that. Much as you would get, you would submit an article for publication or perhaps maybe even a, uh, a grant proposal. You might get feedback and it may be that, oh, you need to modify this, you need to change, you need to add this. Or sometimes it's just not, uh, not acceptable. Uh, and, and, and so you might want to start and maybe submit to another uh, journal uh, for, for a, a publication, for a manuscript. Um, but anyway, this is very, very helpful because uh, it allows people to see where they could improve uh, in their course. Um, and then finally, course reviewers. Now, participants in the uh, cohort, the four-week cohort webinar series are invited to sign up to serve as peer reviewers of courses that are submitted to the exemplary course program. Now, by volunteering to participate as a course reviewer, you can really make your, uh, the, the program, you contributed to the program's success. And there are, are quite a number of benefits in participating uh, as a reviewer in this program. And so, let's see, here we go. Okay. All right, so, oh, here we go. I had to find that. So, as a course reviewer, you can explore in depth a variety of different online courses and get ideas and inspiration for your own online courses, which is really important too. I mean, I, I as a, a, a a person, a professional uh, developer and helping faculty all the time, get to see great examples of, of or examples of, of great courses that people have designed that give me ideas. Uh, but that's just sort of uh, limited to the folks that I, that I meet here at NIU and work with uh, to uh, assist on their courses. So as a faculty or as a course reviewer, you have an opportunity to look at courses from many different institutions and uh, by using your own experience, your own teaching experience, and also your, the, the benefit of the rubric and also maybe instructions by, by participating in the, uh, the, the four-week cohort uh, series, webinar series, you now have developed these skills to, to be able to assess other people's courses, but also to improve your own. So you can apply lessons learned from this, the rubric to your own courses um, or those that you're helping to develop. You can also share your knowledge and experience with others by providing feedback on their course design. So you, you will be able to share what you think might be useful to improve somebody else's courses based on the rubric. You also gain professional development experience and recognition for your own accomplishment and participation in the program. It's one of those things that you can put down, I would imagine, on your faculty service report as your contribution to uh, community. All right, so at this point, I'm going to move on to another presentation. I'm going to ask if, if anyone has any questions. I'm going to open up my other slide presentation. No questions. Okay. All right, so let's talk about now the exemplary course, Blackboard exemplary course program uh, rubric. Now, I'm going to explain how the rubric is graded, and I'm going to share the rubric and share the links to uh, the, I guess, ECP program as well. I will follow that up in an email to you when I send you the, the, uh, the notes of today's presentation, but I'll also show, you know, uh, add that rubric so you can view it, um, have your, it's, it's a PDF file, so you can look at it, as well as links to important sites, uh, websites on, uh, in the Blackboard community. So today, uh, in this portion of the presentation, I'll be, uh, I'll be introducing you to the rubric, and on, I'll be focusing on those four primary areas, the course design, interaction, and collaboration, assessment, and learner support. 
So the exemplary course program uh, rubric is a binary or single point rubric that uses a numerical point value for each standard. So these point values can range from one to five uh, and have to be assigned to standards that indicate the relative importance of that standards with values of five obviously representing compulsory standards. They're the highest you can go. You have to get uh, for all of the standards that are considered to be, uh, that have a value of five, you absolutely have to meet that standard like this in order to be considered uh, exemplary. So across the four categories in, in the rubric, there are a total of 14 compulsory standards. Uh, and in order to receive an exemplary course award, all compulsory standards need to be met. So as I mentioned, there's a, a total of 191 points available in this EC, uh, ECP rubric. So in order to, to get exemplary status, you have to score at least 163 points, which is about uh, the bottom limit of 85%. Uh, if you have 162 points, you, you probably won't get it. Uh, however, the next category uh, below exemplary is compelling. So if you have 80% of that 191 point total, you, that's 153 to 162 points, you would get that recognition. And along with feedback, like this is how you can improve. And then resubmit that, as, that course uh, the next time the um, uh, uh, submissions are open. And then uh, to get a score of promising, which is 70% of that total, is 134 points to 152 points. So let's let's break it down, and, and as I'm saying, I'm going to go through each one of these categories, but I can't, I don't really have the time to go through each specific standard, uh, but I'll highlight some of the standards so that you guys will be aware, especially the ones that are probably most uh, considered to be more important or have higher value. So when I talk about, let me just go back here, when I talk about course design, it addresses really elements of instructional design. So the uh, for the purpose of this rubric, Course design includes such elements as the structure of the course, learning objectives, organization of content, and instructional strategies. So let's look at some of the categories here, some of the standards within this category. Uh, goals and objectives. So this is, I guess this would be a subcategory. So uh, one of the things to be measured on would be goals and objectives are clearly written, appropriate for the course level, and align to desired outcomes. I know that in Quality Matters, uh, uh, alignment of objectives and instructional materials and, and activities and assessments, all is primary. Without having this, this straight line between course level objectives, module level objectives, and all these other aspects like this, everything seems to fall apart. You really need to have that. And when I talk about clearly written, uh, in the goals, course level objectives, uh, I know they used the term goals, but we like to use, uh, at, at least at, at Northern, uh, like to use the, the, the term course level objectives. And they're, 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 although they're, they're broad, they are not vague. Uh, there is some specificity to it. So for instance, in, in my own courses, I, I used to teach courses in uh, Introduction to Public Health, and I would be talking about uh, epidemiology and, and specifically disease transmission. So a course level objective might be by the end of this course, students will be able to uh, uh, identify the various modes of transmission uh, of pathogens. So that would be the, the, the broader level, but, but within a specific unit or module or section or week, depending on how you chunk out the course, uh, there might be a week when, when I'm focusing on that particular course level objective and I'll say by the end, one of the course level objectives might be uh, that students will be able to identify the um, waterborne uh, mode of transmission or airborne mode of transmission. So there are separate module level objectives that together will support that goal, that uh, course level objective of identifying the different modes of transmission for um, uh, pathogens, okay? So they have to be specific. Uh, one of the things we also talk about in creating uh, objectives, whether they're course or uh, module level objectives, is to be careful with the terms that you use. When you say by the end of this course, students will be able to understand, it, you, you have to be able to measure, understand. So it might be easier to say identify or list or summarize, uh, something a little bit more specific. Uh, so once again, 
uh, course level objectives are broad, uh, but not vague, and module level objectives are very specific and measurable. So goals and objectives, this is one point, one point two. Goals and objectives are easily located within the course, uh, within the course visible in a variety of areas. So you could include them in your uh, course syllabus. You could include them in, um, in the actual Blackboard uh, course that you have set up like this. And you may even have them specifically broken up by individual units. Uh, and so this is how I do it. I'll have maybe the very top level of my course, a section, and it'll, I think it's the, the welcome section where I talk about my course level objectives, but within each each uh, specific week or however I break that up, unit, s session, chapter, or whatever, uh, however I do that, um, I will have those specific module level objectives. And you can see that that has a value of four points. But, so it's, it's significant, uh, but the, uh, the compulsory standard in this amongst goals and objectives, the five points is the one that says goals and objectives are clearly written and, and appropriate for the course level. Okay, gonna advance, let's see. Uh, now we have content, composition, and structure. So it's a little bit different. So when we talk about content, content is really made available, and I've already alluded uh, to this uh, before, is made available or chunked in manageable segments. So it's presented in distinct learning units or modules, learning modules. Uh, now, I'm just uh, reflecting back on uh, some folks that I've helped in the past who were teaching for the first time online. They had all of the content in one area. It wasn't really segmented at all. It was just a whole long list of material, of content, of lectures, of, of, of documents, of links to, to videos, and in not any specific order. And, and so um, it was at that point, it's important to uh, to recognize that this this may be the first time folks are teaching, and so they may not really understand the need to chunk out to make manageable. Um, and this actually is reflected not just in the content as a whole, but specific aspects of the content. So if you have a lecture uh, that may be an hour long, you may think about chunking those things out maybe into 10-minute segments. And so there might be uh, six 10-minute segments, depending on, on, on the nature of the content and, and what makes logical sense. Uh, to be able to do that because when, when folks are online, uh, they may lose attention very quickly. Okay. So you want to want to make sure that they can come back and, and complete all of the the material. Uh, content, let's see here. So content is enhanced with multimedia uh, and that could be the use of videos and audios, images, interactive learning objects. Uh, and so you might use things like uh, Kaltura. Yes, Rosebed. Bruce Bet. Dan, can you please give an example for 1.4? 1. 1.4, 1. Uh, sure. Uh, let me ch 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 I'm going to, let's see, I'm, I'm in uh, slide six. I'm going to share my screen so you can see what that would look like. Okay. Uh, uh, share application. Okay, this is taking a little bit of time. All right, so here we go. So I don't think I wanted to sh necessarily share this, but I guess I could. Um, tell you what, even better, I'm gonna share something. So this is the Online Course Design Academy. Uh, which we do with our faculty. Uh, we offer this. Uh, we offered this several times in the summer. I just finished uh, a online course design academy session in November. So it's broken up like this. This is welcome the welcome page, so that students when they click on that they can uh, it'll open up and provide them with with important information. Okay. okay. So right here, welcome to the online course design academy. Uh, there is a uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this is a video that welcomes people to the academy. Um, there is the transcript for that video. This is only about a, a minute and a half long. Uh, there is a listing of important dates, course descriptions. This is where you have the course level objective. So all of this is contained in a specific area. You even have a course uh, tour. Uh, later on in, in, the, in this, uh, our today's session, I'll, I'll show a little bit about what this course tour would look like. And uh, as you go down, uh, 
other components, okay? But you can see right here that they're all broken up. Syllabus is the schedule. It's not all together in one session, but I wanted to go down and I'll give you a student view so you can see what, what they would see. So I want you to, I want to ask you, uh, either Rusbad Rus, uh, or anyone, what is unusual about the way this is chunked out? You see units three, two, one, and zero. What, what shoots out at you? Unit zero is usually you don't have a unit zero, right? That's one. Okay, well that that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Okay. So I uh, so uh, yes. yeah, okay. so, yeah, so yeah. yes. on, on the bottom. Ex exactly. So what happens here, let me explain this. What happens here is right is that usually typically when people look at that, they'll have unit one at the top and unit two, unit three like this. But as you go through the through the semester, sometimes people will, well, might get uh, uh, might get distracted and not recognize that oh we're actually in unit three and I'm still focusing on unit two. So what what we do is we reverse order the 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 uh, the, the different units the way this is all segmented. And of course, each unit has its own is like its own little mini city uh, where it contains all of the important elements um, in there. And so these are all released. Uh, using adaptive release. So uh, when, we open, when we open up the course, unit one, that's the first thing. That's the only thing people will see. They'll see unit one or unit zero. And then the first week of the course, and that uses, and since I open up the course uh, about three or four days before the start of the, uh, of the, of the uh, semester, this is what students will see getting started. And we'll talk about getting started. I'll, I'll look at that more specifically. But in, in the first week, unit one now will appear at the very top. And I tell, I tell the participants, whether it's faculty or whether it's students, graduate students or undergrad students, that whatever is at the top of the list will be the one that's most current. So it makes it really easy. So in week two, unit two appears now, and that's because it's released with adaptive release, and, and, and so it becomes visible. So students say, okay, this week we're talking about instructor presence and, uh, and materials. And then in week three, student support and your course plan. So these are all important aspects that are relevant, that are collected together, but that appear in a specific order. Thank you so much, uh, Rusbet. I appreciate you asking. Um, and that's a, that's a, a, that's a very important question. And that's one thing that, that I'm glad you asked uh, immediately. Okay. Okay. Let me just stop the sharing there. Let's go back to the presentation. I wanted to remember I was in slide six. Okay. So content is made available or chunk. So you can say it didn't make sense to have things that are part of unit one or week one or session one or module one together in one uh, one location. So there's no uh, there's no uh, confusion. Students know, it, especially if they're looking at their at their uh, uh, unit or module level objectives. This is what we're supposed to do this week. And when I go back to show you later on, I'll show you how that's broken up so that it's it's consistent. The next week it looks exactly the same in unit two and unit three and unit four so that, that the students are not searching for something. I'd also mentioned the use of multimedia videos. And, and so, um, although I didn't play it, uh, I did have a, um, a welcome to the course uh, video. There was also, as I scroll down that page uh, just a minute ago, there also was a course tour. So it's actually a, um, a screencast uh, of how to navigate through the course. It makes it very, very easy. Okay, and so once again, and if you look at the item below that navigation is intuitive, it becomes intuitive if it's clear if it, and if it's consistent. Um, if people have to figure out how to use something, uh, then you either have to redesign it or you create a tutorial that actually walks people through the steps. Um, I actually have the best of both worlds from my limited perspective in that I do have a tour of the course but I usually give that on the first day of, uh, of class. We're actually, I'm, I'm going through, and, and just, like, just as we're doing right now using Blackboard Collaborate, I will share my screen and I'll record as I'm going through, with the advantage that people can ask questions while I'm, while I'm doing that. If, if I record it uh, on my own without any, uh, anybody in, in the class or uh, at the time, uh, they don't have an opportunity to ask a question for clarification. So um, I save that recording and I make it available to students. Okay, let's just see. 
going to go on to learner engagement, which is which is another uh, aspect of course design. So it's clear how the instructional strategy will enable student uh, learners to reach their course goals and objectives. And so instruct, uh, instructions or overview of course activities is provided and aligned to course objectives. And we'll, uh, I'll give you an example of that. I don't want to, at this point, go you know back and forth and sharing that uh, you know my screen because it's a little disruptive, but, but I, I promise you to come back to this one. Yes, Cassandra, you have a question. I do. I do. I do. Sorry about you that. Wanna, you want to lower your volume. Lower your volume. There, can okay. you hear me? Yes. I actually had two computers open, so that's why it happened. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I've had that. Uh, so I was wondering, I actually have a lot of content in terms of films and short videos and also lectures. And you had mentioned um, providing transcripts of these, and I hadn't thought of like hearing impaired students. Um, is there a service that we can use to um, to access in order to get a transcript of uh, films or videos, or is this something we have to do ourselves? Um. Actually, that's a great question. Uh, the thing is, because there is a component of accessibility, I think it's the next item actually, so you anticipated quite well. Um, uh, the Disability Resource Center will, has the service available, so, you, so they will caption your material, uh, making it easier, not just for students with uh, hearing disability, but uh, all students who could benefit from having captions available uh, in video content. Now, with that said, uh, Northern actually has a uh, an account with Kaltura. Kaltura actually is this media uh, hosting service. It also streams. It also stores and provides a lot of uh, important uh, uh, service for the university. But what most important from my uh, perspective is that it does auto captions. And so you, you record your video, you upload it to Kaltura, and it does take a little bit of time, but eventually it will become uh, uh, available, maybe a couple of hours, or they, as they say in the south side of Chicago, a couple, two, three hours. Um, and then you can go and you, and you can have access to those captions. However, sometimes it does a really good job of captioning. However, with uh, you know, different disciplines, people have certain professional jargon, uh, and sometimes in the effort to uh, do that conversion from from the uh, spoken voice voice to the written uh, written material. Uh, it may not get it accurate, so you have the ability to go back and edit uh, uh, captions where appropriate. I've always liked that feature, and I, I usually do it. I I don't um, have extremely long ones. I, I've actually had my uh, lectures captioned uh, by people in in my department uh, quite a while ago. Uh, so I don't really need to do that. However, I do a lot of other video recordings, either tutorials or uh, just-in-time learning, where I'm warning people how to how to use a particular tool. Maybe it, it's something I'm, I've used I'm using for the first time. So I, I walk through with students, and I can show you an example of that too, so that they're familiar with that. And in that case, I do use the um, Kaltura because it does a nice job, and there. Are, uh, anywhere from three minutes to, to seven minutes long, so not very long at all. But believe me, when you have to caption, it takes a lot of time, and you want to be as accurate as possible. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you very much. That was helpful. Thank you, Cassandra. I appreciate you asking the question. All right, so um, for learning engagement, it's clear how instruction, uh, instructional strategies will enable learners to reach goals and objectives, and so you're talking about providing instructions or an overview of course, activities, and, uh, and I, I will be showing that in just a few minutes. Uh, there's also course design includes guidance for learners to work with content in meaningful ways. And so providing clear instructions, you want to have content outline, you want to have maybe even a course orientation, which is what, uh, which is what I actually uh, was only teasing with you uh, a little while ago, but I'll actually show you and uh, as we proceed. Let's see. Okay. Technology use. So once again, all of these things are under the under the umbrella of course design. So LMS tools are used to reduce the labor intensity of learning. So you you want to provide links to needed resources that that they'll be used in the course. Uh, I, I have a faculty member that every semester he teaches uh, physics. He integrates publisher material 
uh, that is part. It, it's part of the uh, the service uh, that they have with the textbook, which is which is uh, sold by that publisher. And by incorporating it into the course, it's seamless. Uh, so students can actually read the text, they can go to the lectures, but they can also take, do their homework assignments because it's part of this publisher service. So they provide streamlined access to this uh, su uh, supplementary materials. It's going to advance again here. So once again, you're going to be getting the, the rubric. So don't worry about not being able to see all of these um, specific or all of these standards. So accessibility of course design, the design and delivery of content in, uh, integrate alternative resources. So the ability, this is what Cassandra was asking, whether there's transcripts or captions that are available or anything that enables assistive, uh, assistive uh, uh, processes, whether it's voice recognition or screen reading, um, which actually is the next item here, course files. Uh, documents, PDFs, presentations are easily readable by assistive technology. And one of the things that, that I'm uh, uh, grateful for is that my um, course syllabus and my uh, course schedule are all formatted so that they are in fact readable by uh, screen readers. Um, it really is, is uh, a, something that you can do in a Microsoft Word because it uses styles. I had not uh, worked with styles in, in, in the past, but uh, one of our colleagues, um, Claire Duval, uh, is really, uh, I, I guess, very knowledgeable in the use of creating accessible documents. And so, in fact, in the Online Course Design Academy, that example that I was showing you, uh, we have an assignment that works with that. Yes, Cassandra? Yeah, I was wondering how you access the publisher um, sources that you were talking about. That would you contact the publisher directly? Yes, yes. This okay. is something that, uh, and and now not all publisher material is uh, usable in the um, Ultra Course View. Ultra Course View is the is the more recent view. In fact, there's uh, although every every month more and more of the uh, features that were available in the original course view become available in the ultra course view. So at one point blogs weren't uh, weren't uh, accessible, journals weren't, and I think they have increasingly been adding those features uh, as we go along since the ultra course view has been released. And I know that there were some issues uh, initially with some publishers who were not able to get their, uh, their course integrated or their materials integrated with uh, folks who are using the publisher's textbooks. But that's becoming uh, increasingly rare. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let's just go over very quickly the compulsory uh, standards for this course design is that goals and objectives are clearly written and appropriate for the course level and design uh, and align to the desired outcomes. And so what we're talking about is the connection between the goals and objectives and all those things that connect that, uh, including the, uh, the uh, course materials and the instructional activities, as well as the assessments. Content is made available or chunked in manageable segments. Um, I'll give you some, I gave you some examples of that, so whether they're broken up into units or modules or weeks or sections or chapters. And it's clear how the instructional strategies will enable learners to reach course goals and objectives. Course designs include guidance for learners to work with content in meaningful ways. And the design and delivery of content integrate, uh, integrate alternative resources, such as, such as the use of transcripts and um, closed captionings and accessible documents. Course files are easily readable by assistive technology. Okay, so now and I, I'm looking now we have about 20 minutes more to go here, so I'm going to have to go pick up the pace just a little bit. Uh, the second category is interaction and collaboration. Interaction and collaboration. And uh, so we start with the subcategory of communication strategies. So uh, standard 2.1, Synchronous communicating, uh, communication activities benefit from real-time interactions. So you have students uh, who are practicing in uh, discussing course content extemporaneously. And I have students do that myself, and I actually do have office hours, virtual office hours, 
uh, every every Wednesday evening uh, during the fall semester from 7 to, to 8 o'clock where people can come in and, and talk to me and ask questions. I can share notes. Uh, just as I'm sharing this PowerPoint right now with you, they can ask questions about that and, and they can even, I can uh, even change their status so that they can actually push content and share something with me and so we can discuss that too. Uh, there is an exam review session possibilities. You can even have students uh, lead a, uh, a meeting uh, where appropriate. Uh, and then, of course, you can always have real-time class meetings. I have one real-time class meeting in my uh, fall semester course. It's using uh, Blackboard Collaborate, but most of it is asynchronous. Um, but I do have that weekly, or you know, it's the weekly two hours a week office hours. So I will meet with my students in the session for questions that they may have. There are opportunities for synchronous, uh, that's live meeting sessions, and asynchronous, which is discussion boards, emails interactions as appropriate. So I use both of those quite heavily in, in, in my course. Development of learning communities. For me, in fact, whenever I send out an email or, or post an announcement, I always, rather than saying for our class or for you students, I always refer to them as members of our community, of our course community. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll show, you, show you an example of that uh, as soon as we're done with this right here. Um, but uh, let's see, collaboration activities reinforce course content and learning uh, outcomes while building a workplace useful skills. So we're talking about any activities that involve cooperation or negotiation, consensus building. For me, it is in the area of teamwork. I have always included teamwork, even though I know students don't necessarily <laughs> like to do it or they don't necessarily love to do it. Uh, teamwork because sometimes they feel that they're doing the bulk of the uh, of the work and so I have certain strategies that I use to make sure that people that there is equity that there is equity in sharing the the, the, the workload um, and then I tell students this is, you know you will get you will get to know your your teammates not everyone likes each other by the end of the session although I think that's increasingly rare this this past semester uh, in fact, I'm, I'm doing uh, the uh, team case study analysis presentations this week, last week, and, and, and this week. And we have teammates who are just glowing about their teammates after their presentation. I record the presentation. After that, they're glowing about how well they worked with their, uh, with their um, uh, team, um, teammates. It's just wonderful. So they have an opportunity, not just for this course, but also to take those positive experiences and those skills learned into their post uh, college years and into their, their professional lives. Uh, and I think it's important to have that. And I do have, uh, make myself available for solving any, any issues, uh, any problems between teammates, uh, looking at, at group dynamic. Let's see, learner to learner and learner to instructor interactions are required as part of the course. And of course, uh, a big part of that is when people respond, uh, submit an assignment and I'm able to get back to them, uh, on how they did in their in their assignments, uh, that would be learner to instructor. But learner to learner actually is an important one as well because I, I have an opportunity uh, to have students work with each other in that in that group activity, or in fact uh, in the uh, discussion board assignments where I, I make it uh, a part of the assignment where they not just have to respond to the discussion board forum topic topic, but also to respond to at least two of their colleagues for each assignment. And uh, probably as important is that I give them an example, an exemplar of what a good response looks like rather than just saying, well, you know, you can say whatever you want, right on, really good, I agree. That's never acceptable. Uh, and so I give them an example of how to respond. Um, and then activities are designed to help build a sense of community rather than each learner perceiving himself or herself studying independently. I think that's probably uh, most relevant at this point. Uh, because people are, are, are not on campus and they don't have that sense of, of seeing each other on a daily or weekly basis. Yes, Ruspe. Dan, can you please clarify on, on the part where you mentioned I give them, I show them how to respond. Like, what do you, can you give an example again? Like, what, what is, sure. like, what do you tell them how to respond when it comes to responding? I think that the best example is to use, uh, work from previous semesters that students have submitted okay. um, and, and in which case and, and I, I have a, an email that I sent out at the end of the semester to certain students whose work not just meets the standard that I said but exceeds it 
Mm -hmm. And um, I have never had a student who I've requested to use work who wasn't who wasn't uh, flattered, deeply flattered, that their work would be used uh, to to be shared for future cohorts of students who are taking the class. Um, so there is there is not a a, uh, a paucity of available material that I use uh, because students really uh, feel good about themselves that they did really well and 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 that their legacy can 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 be continued on. So and I ask them. You know, I, I can take your name off if you want. And some say, yeah, take the name off. And some say, no, no, leave it on. They're proud of that stuff. And so when students in the current semester see that, they say, oh, this is, this is what a good response looks like. Uh, in addition to having a, a rubric, which actually tells them specifically what are those criteria that they need to meet and what level of accomplishment to get the highest score possible. So they have a lot of information on it when uh, responding whether that's a uh, discussion board uh, assignment or a much more involved assignment, like I have a, a single case, uh, a single case study analysis assignment and a team case study analysis assignment. And I give examples of both of those so that students are not left in the dark as to how they should respond. All right. Yes, Babette. You're welcome, Ruspe. Babette, uh, you had a question? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Thank you. Okay. Can I jump back to where you have that Wednesday meeting? Because I would like to do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, is that one-on-one -on -one or is that just open as you're sitting there? How does that work? Okay, that's a great it's question. Yeah. So just, just imagine that you have an office hours face to face. What right. typically happens? You usually have one person come in and you talk with that person and then you may have the door slightly ajar, but, but there's some privacy there. So in, in a session like this, this is Blackboard Collaborate, people can come in like this and we're all together and sometimes that, that is warranted. You want to have like a, like a, uh, an exam, you know, uh, maybe a review session for an exam, an upcoming exam like that. And you want to have multiple people in there. But if you have a session uh, where, where one person has maybe some personal problems and they, they want to share that with you, you can actually pull people into a breakout room okay. and, and then pull them and then have a conversation. It's just you and that one person like this. And you can leave a slide like this, this slide that you're seeing right here, but the slide will say, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, momentarily in a breakout room. I'll, I will return in just a few minutes. If you're coming in to ask questions like this, please uh, stay in the session, and, and I'll, I'll be happy to respond. So you get the the the, uh, the benefits of both of both worlds. Oh, okay? nice! Great, thank you very much, Dan. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just see. So what I want to do is is I want to uh, 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 jump ahead right here. I've got inter uh, interactive logistics, but for the last aspect of of this uh, of this section. Uh, let's see. Fifteen. The uh, for interaction and collaboration, a rubric or equivalent grading document is included to explain how participation will be evaluated. Always important to have that to make it really clear. Now, this is just one of those uh, standards. Uh, there were there were quite a number more than this right here. This is probably the most important one, but I want to come back and give you examples of each one of these compulsory standards. All right, assessments, and we've only got a few more minutes, so I'm going to go through assessments a little bit quicker. So assessments, and I'll just go through the compulsory standards here. Is it's clear to students how performance in an assessment will be evaluated, and we're coming back to this idea of having a rubric. Um, having uh, or an equivalent grading document. Now, these things are, <laughs> and and I've I've become aware of this too. I, I'm a big believer in rubrics, but but it's not for everyone. Uh, sometimes people say, well, sometimes rubrics are too confining. So uh, instead, they'll have something like an equivalent grading document, which actually allows students to see how they're being uh, uh, assessed, without having those specific categories to to fill in. Um, and this. Uh, uh, Revealing how students are going to be assessed can be part of an uh, part of your syllabus uh, as well. 
Uh, I'm going to just jump down right here. Examples of quality work are provided to the students. As I mentioned right here, this is learner expectations. You want to make sure that, that uh, learners have a good or students have a good idea of, of where they need to be in order to, to respond. That would be considered a, a, an acceptable or even an exemplary uh, submission. So I always use work from uh, previous semesters for students so that students know it's, it's not me recreating something and, and it might be something that they, they would feel oh, I could never do that. Something like this, which, which you have a student who do, does very well, gives them a positive role model. Uh, assignment uh, design. Assessment activities occur frequently throughout the duration of the course. So especially with an online course, you don't want to leave people by themselves for several weeks where they're not sure what they should do. Certainly you might have stuff for them to read. You might have recorded lectures. Um, but if you don't have anything that they, they can actually do engagement, like an active, like a learning activity or an, an assignment, uh, they may lose interest in the course or they may not become involved and may, they may step away for a couple of weeks and they come back in and they've got to really, you know, they have to overcome inertia. Now they have to get geared up for what, what it is. So it's important uh, not just to have uh, material for them to do and it's not busy work. It actually should reflect uh, something that they can work on to learn skills that will, that will be useful for the next week's material. So you want to have a uh, 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 assessment act uh, occurring frequently. You also want to have multiple types of assessments. So if you have a, a weekly quiz, multiple choice quiz every week, it really is, get, is having them respond to questions. And it may be uh, that for certain types of classes, maybe some, some undergraduate classes, lower division, that you do have, you rely on multiple choice or true false uh, questions or fill in the blanks. But it's probably a, a good idea to have a different, ty different types of assessments. So you know, in addition to having an objective test, you might have discussion board assignments or you might have research projects, something that really uh, will measure them in a variety of different areas. Yes, Cassandra. Is there a way for students to submit? I have uh, weekly quizzes and weekly exercises. And the exercises really require that I upload a format for them to fill out. Um, is there a way to submit that um, other than sending me an email? Uh, sure. When you create an assignment, uh, you would have that format as part of the assignment. Um, and then students would be submitting that as when they, when they, whenever they submit, just as they would submit any other assignment. For something like that, maybe you and I should schedule a consultation so I could walk you through that. And I'm happy okay. to do that. Okay. Great. That's great. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So learner self-assessment is another aspect uh, of assessment right here. Obviously, it has only two point values. It's still important, but not, not as important. So opportunities for learner self-assessment are provided. So you might actually give them a practice test. You might have them do something which is in a journal, asking them, what did you learn this week? Actually, that might be more a self-reflection uh, or some kind of a quiz, low stakes quiz, so that students have, a, have an opportunity to, to uh, test themselves. Okay, and so the compulsory standards for assessment is that it's clear to students how performance in assessments will be evaluated um, by using a rubric or an equivalent grading uh, document. Act, uh, assessments activities occur frequently throughout the semester and there are multiple types of assessments that are being used. So those are compulsory. And finally, learner support. Um, I didn't realize how important learner support was uh, until just uh, about uh, a year ago. Um, I just didn't really think it was that important to include, but it is. Orientation materials explain how to navigate both the LMS and the course. So you're saying, well, it's, it's obvious to me how to navigate. It's, it's, it's intuitive, but it may not be intuitive, especially if you're dealing with students who are new to online instruction, um, or maybe you're dealing with students who are trying to uh, <laughs> navigate through an instructor who is new to instruction or new to teaching online. Uh, orientation materials are easily found and a clear return to other areas of the course, also an important, that's orientation, instructor contact information and communication, so it's important that contact information for the instructor be easily found, otherwise students will be struggling and say, well, how do I get in, in, in touch with my instructor? This is, uh, this is making me crazy, I can't, I want I just want to have a simple question. Uh, course institutional policies and support, so course institutional policies such as how to behave, uh, what's the decorum, what's the netiquette, are included and easy to find. Okay, let's just see. Uh, accessibility and technical t uh, factors for 
uh, for learner support. Alternative type files are available. So you might want to have something which actually deals with learner needs and or choice and availability. Uh, multimedia is optimized for web delivery. So uh, when people say, well, I want to upload my video to my Blackboard course, um, I will say, mm, you don't want to really do it to the Blackboard course because the Blackboard server is not a media streaming server. We do, in fact, uh, have Kaltura, uh, which is which is great. Um, right now, we used to use something called Medial. Uh, we're, we're winding down on Medial because uh, Kaltura is a better service. And even some people will post things some people will, put, will uh, post material in YouTube to be able to share that because it is a, a good streaming service. Let's see, and then feedback, uh, and this is so important. Uh, learners have the opportunity to give feedback to the instructor regarding course design and course content during both the course delivery and after course completion. Now, I would say that most people get that feedback after the course in the form of, uh, in the form of course evaluations. However, you can uh, design a, a, a survey, a relative, you know, a anonymous, maybe using SurveyMonkey, uh, or maybe have an anonymous uh, discussion board posting where you actually are requesting information from students, like how do you think the course is going? What works? What isn't working? How can I make it better? Uh, well, and I think the students are more invested if you take that information that they've shared and you actually implement it while the course is ongoing. I think it, 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 it really connects you with the, with the students. Okay. So the uh, compulsory standards are, let's see, let's see. Uh, let's see. Bobette, can you hold on just a second? Let me just get through this last area. Orientation materials explain how to navigate both the LMS and the course. Once again, get this, getting the students comfortable with your course online. Contact information for the instructor is easy to find. Course instructor policies are, are also easy to find and learners have the opportunity to provide feedback. Okay, so those are things you absolutely want to have in your in your course if you're looking at uh, at the Blackboard Collaborate, I mean the Blackboard uh, 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 exemplary course rubric. Yes, Babette, please. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering if it would be appropriate to add, say, at the end of their discussion, they have maybe a chapter reading and they answer three or four questions, and then how do you think the course is going? What what do you feel is working? Share with two peers. Adding oh, yeah. that to their discussion activity? Excellent okay. idea. Excellent idea. I, and, and the benefit, of course, is that students now can see each other's uh, material like this. And so now there is this, there right. is this, this fascinating, um, uh, I guess, exchange of ideas. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity right. to, to not just you learning, but also students themselves. Okay, it's right. three o'clock, but Thank I wanted you. to show a few more things. You're welcome. I wanted to show a few more things. Some of the things that I do to, to create a sense of community, uh, I use Flipgrid, and I use that right here just so that you'll see, introduce yourself to our community. Um, so I, I have students actually, you know, from day one, looking at, at, at what they're taking as a community, not as, oh, this is the class that I'm taking, and this is what I have to do. And you can see that I've got 26 responses to this right here. So this is my recording. Uh, and, and giving them instructions on what to do. And then as we scroll down the list right here, oops, oh, well, it, it's not allowing me to scroll down for whatever reason right here. But I've got 26 people. Uh, I just have the first name and last initial. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, and, and everyone has responded to that. What I want, though, is I want to have people who are responding back and forth to each other. And, I, I, and this is from last year's... Uh, I guess Flipgrid session, where I had people who were, um, I wanted them to respond to each other. And so maybe Emmanuel G said, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so, um, this is my first year here at NIU, I went to Burr Ridge High School. Somebody else, maybe uh, Armreel will say, hey, I graduated there last year too, maybe we, we, we missed each other. So you start developing this, the, these connections. Then later on in the semester, when I, when I have these people put into groups, they will, um, uh, They'll know who, he, who each other is. So Amril will know who Emmanuel is. She'll be able to go back and she'll, she'll play that video and she'll recognize that that, that is somebody that, uh, that they already have some familiarity with. Okay. I promised you I was going to show you this uh, before the end. Um, and so this is just can a video. You repeat, can you repeat the, uh, the software that you were using? Oh, Flipgrid? Um, it's called Flipgrid. 
Um, and so I'm sorry, actually, the writing's just really small. Okay, flip through. Uh -oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Did this make a difference? Yes. Okay, if that Flipgrid is actually online, uh, it's something that you, 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 you get an account, it's free, uh, which is great, uh, and I had great success in using it. I also use something called VoiceThread. Let me see if I can, and, and VoiceThread actually, what it is, it is, you know, people, I will post a video. Let me just see really quickly. This is the video. Greetings, everyone. You are in the correct location to post your team weekly status report. I'm not sure whether you can hear that, but this is just me giving them instructions. I want, you know, I want these teams to have some accountability. And so I says, every week I want you to post what you've done this week. And one person is gonna be the primary um, status reporter and the other person uh, who is on the team uh, will also add uh, their input, although not to the, not to the, to the same degree as the status reporter. So I have, I have CB and I have HH who are responding and, and I'm responding to them as well. You know, so I have, my, I have me here, they're responding and then right here, uh, I'm responding to CBs, and I just didn't respond to HAs uh, this time. Um, but it actually allows me to, to connect with students, to check with students right here. And, and so uh, in the past, I was just using the discussion board. One person would post, and nobody would ever see it in that, in that group. This time, they're required to respond to each other. And by the end of the session, by, by the end of the, the se series of, of, of uh, reports, they're talking to, uh, to each other back and forth. I don't even have to, uh, to involve myself anymore. Okay, it's 303. Uh, this okay, is VoiceThread, you said? This is, yeah, this is VoiceThread. VoiceThread is also a free, and it's integrated with Blackboard, so you can add it with uh, within your Blackboard course. Uh, you can also use it to, to post um, your mm -hmm. lectures, to create your lectures, record your lectures, and post Thanks, them. Laura. One of the nice things is that uh, if a student has a question about this recorded lecture, they can actually record a question within that, that will get sent back to you as an email that says, hey, somebody's asked this question and you can go back and you can respond. So even though it's asynchronous, you can respond as if it's, if it's in real time, which is wonderful. Okay, anyway, I just wanted to play just a, a few seconds of this video. Welcome to the Online Course Design Academy. My name is Dan Cabrera and I'll be facilitating this section of the Academy. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what the Academy Okay, great. All right, I think we, we are out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's session. Um, I hope you found some value uh, in today's uh, workshop.